Father, we thank you for your word, for your word is a light and a lamp. We thank you, God, that you are, that everything is your story. It's his story, as well as history. May we experience the, the breadth and the depth and the width of your love, God, through the power of your word. May somebody that's here find that your word is more than they ever imagined. These things we ask for your glory and your power and your kingdom. Amen. Amen. As dark as Judges was, is as light as Ruth is. Ruth is the ultimate love story. Now, let me give you a little bit of background. Ruth happened in chronological order to the book of Judges. Some suggest it happened around chapter 6 of Judges. Right smack dab in the middle of the time of the Judges. So there was still, even in your darkness, even in their darkness should I say, the hand of God reaches in and does miraculous things. Even in the darkest of times, God has not abandoned you. It's been well said, when you are down to nothing, God is up to something. Now, there is application in the book of Ruth unlike almost any other book. For right here, right now, you are going to see played out the clearest outline of any other book. I'm telling you, the book of Ruth is possibly the closest thing we have to Jesus Christ's plan of redemption and his perfect perfect propitiation of our sin right here in the middle. This little tiny, I'm telling you, by the time this book's over, you're going to be like, I cannot believe that happened. Now, to look at a book, to look at a book in the Bible, especially a book like Ruth, understand this, that there's first a few primary applications, first of which is what's called historic reality. The historic reality, or what we call the actual level. What happened? When? How? When? Why? This is called the historical reality of what it was. Then, the scholars, and you guys that are deep into studying, and if you want, we're going to do a little Bible uh, college stuff here. You have what's called the exegesis. Now, the fact that the word Jesus is in there is not the Lord Jesus. It's a G. It's to exegete the passage. It's a fancy word for studying. When you exegete, or you do your exegesis, that means, according to the scholars, what the book says. What does it say? say, to pull every word in the origin of the word. Now, you guys that are new to Scripture, you understand. You're reading the Bible. But the Bible is not a book. It's actually 66 books, 70 if you count the four different chapters of uh, Psalms, written over about a 1,500 year time span by about 40 different authors. It's what's called an integrated message system. Nothing by accident. Now, the book was also written, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek and parts in Aramaic. You exegete the passages that you're reading and you're finding out what it really says. What does it say? However, then you do what's called your exposition. Which is, what does it mean? What does it mean? I was talking to my brother Joey today, and I said, you know, there's a passage in Scripture that says, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Well, what does that mean? What is the exposition of it? Sowing to give out seed. You guys know what a sower is. To reap is those who take in. Now, to exegete, or to do your exegesis on the text, it's somebody who's sowing in tears is reaping in joy. But, what does it mean? Those who pray with tears shall reap with happiness and blessing. Oh, I'm starting to see, that's what it means. But then, you have what's called the homiletics. The homiletics. You've got exegeting, exposition, homiletics. The homiletics are the application or message. So that same section of Scripture, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now, I see what it says. I see what it means. Now, how can I apply it? 
Well, you apply that passage by saying, if I pray with tears, not just, hey God, thanks for the spaghetti, amen. <laughs> but God, heal my mom, but heal her in the spirit. And you choke and you... <clears throat> the Bible says you, you make groan. The Bible says that you have groanings that cannot be uttered and the Lord Jesus hears because he is the great intercessor, the Bible says. And he, he takes your prayer somehow, some way this comes off of you and there's some visual thing that the angels take and they deliver. It's crazy. It's crazy. That's the homiletic. And then there's the prophetic. What is uh, scholars call the mystical or the prophetic insight. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. What does that mean? It means that prophetically speaking, the Lord Jesus with great tears cried. Drops of blood flowed from his head. And because of that, we have access to heaven. The prophetic. Now again, the exegetic, the expositional, the homiletic, the prophetic. And then there's what rabbis call the ramez, which is the hint of something deeper or a signpost that says, dig here. You ever drive down the road and you see a sign that says, dig here or don't dig here? That, sometimes you see something. And why am I going through all this today? The book of Ruth has got these Man in overdrive. Every word, every sentence. I, it's like when I'm preparing to teach the book of Ruth, I don't even know how to do it. I'm like, oh, here's what I'm going to I'm going to read the whole thing first. Then I'm going to come back. No, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go line by line. Then I'm going I'm to interpret the names. Oh, oh, my goodness. How do you do it? It's so much. It's what, there's a great commentator. If you're ever looking for a commentator on book, there's a guy named Warren Wiersbe. And he calls this book the most pregnant book of the Bible. So pregnant. Every line. But then there's also, if you're big into studying, what's called the hermeneutics. That's your personal attitude. Everybody can have your hermeneutic. What, what's your hermeneutical bend? Some people have a certain type of hermeneutics where they must have the NASB. The NASB Bible, it's the most literal translation. No, 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 line by line, we have to go through it. That's it. That's my personal hermeneutics. Some little looser, they read the NIV. I'm just teasing. My wife reads the NIV. I'm not a fan of it, but it's loose, man. It's loose. It's, it's, it's more for those that have hermeneutics who just want to know the spirit. What's the spirit of it? That's your personal hermeneutics. Now, there's one last thing we want to look at before we get into the study of this word. Hosea chapter 12 in verse 10 says, The words spoken by the prophets, I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Similitudes. Similitudes. That is what's called types of. This book, more than anything else, you will see that each character is a type of. For instance, when reading, we're going to come across a woman named Naomi. When we overview Naomi, her life completely models the nation of Israel, the nation who is God's chosen, yet felt abandoned, yet wanted nothing to do with God, yet in the end found great redemption. That is a type of or a similitude. In Hosea, he says, this is how I will reach my people. By the end of reading the book of Ruth, first of all, you're going to be sure it's a New Testament book, and it's not. And you're going to do one other thing. You're going to say, how do the Jews that believe in the Torah read this book and not believe in Jesus? How? It's so clear. It's one of the most frustrating passages if you're a Jew because you can't get beyond it. You can't get by the fact that all of these similitudes or types are there. Boaz is a perfect picture of what's called the kinsman redeemer. What's that? 
Oh, if you're new to scripture, the kinsman redeemer, you had to be bought back. You had to be redeemed. And you were redeemed by your father, by your quote unquote brother. He is our kinsman redeemer. No, no, that one's mine. He belongs to me. Same thing that happens with Boaz. By the end of this thing, you're going to be like, amazing. I'll tell you something about the book of Ruth, too. It's probably the widest, widest read book in colleges today out of all the books of the Bible. Because of the love story aspect of it, it is the most beautiful love story you've ever heard. They read it. Now, they don't get the spiritual aspect of it, the vast majority of them, but in secular schools, they read the book of Ruth as just the most beautiful love story it's a tale of loyalty. It's a tale of redemption. It's a tale of never-ending love. I'm telling you. Wait till you... You ready? Yeah. Let's do it. The book of Ruth, verse 1, chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife, and his two sons. Again, give me your attention, please. I'm not going to stop after every verse, but believe me, I could. The best stories that are written right from the beginning, they tell you what. They tell you who, what, where, when, why, and how. And right there it is. Verse 1, chapter 1. Who, what, when, where, why, how. Everything, there it is, falling down on you. Here he says, first of all, in the days of the judges. Remember I talked to you guys about that? It's, they suggest it's in about chapter 6. There was a famine in the land. Now, scripturally speaking, there was 13 famines. 12 of them were associated with the judgment of God. In Israel, you know the time of the judges, especially we just went through it. The people were lost. There's all get out. There was a famine. And most scholars agree it was pronounced by God, trying to get the attention. Now, again, let's look at the homiletic or application of it. Isn't it funny how when God wants to get our attention, He puts a famine in our land? Personally speaking, nationally speaking, nationally speaking, spiritually speaking, He's trying to get your attention. There's a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. Now, why does he mention Bethlehem, Judah? Remember we said there'd be certain signposts, dig here. This is one of them. This is the first one in the book of Ruth. Bethlehem. Beth Where do I know Bethlehem from? The Lord Jesus. Guess what? Same place. So why did he say Bethlehem, Judah? Because there were multiple Bethlehems. Bethlehem, the word Bethlehem means Bethlehem, which is house of bread. Famine in the land? House of bread? Famine at the house of bread? So much here, guys. There is so much here. Do you guys remember the story when they were in the field and the angel made the announcement that the Savior was to be born? Guess where that was? Bethlehem, Judah. And guess whose field they were in? Boaz, the exact same field of the guy that we're going to read. Amazing stuff. Oh, it's, we haven't even started yet if you're into this. If you're into this, this is crazy. So, Judah, Bethlehem Judah went to dwell in a country of Moab. Now, just for information, Moab is about 75 miles away, and it's quite a journey. It's a trek, mountains, and all that stuff, hills. So it's no walk in the park. Now, why they would go to Moab, when we know we just learned about the Moabites in Judah, Moabites were a shunned people. They were Israel's enemies. Israel, Israelites weren't supposed to go near them. They certainly weren't supposed to marry them. Now, if a Jew was going to Moab for food, believe me, and some scholars think that they were doing the wrong thing to begin with, you might think that also after you see what happens to them. So there is absolutely some extenuating circumstances that said, hey, listen, we're going to die in Israel. Let's take our family and go to Moab. I heard at least there's bread there. But it also did show that the man we're about to hear about, Elimelech, he had some, uh, what do they call, moxie? He had some guts because he was now becoming what's called a sojourner or a resident alien. He knew he was going to be amongst, wow, 
a sojourner. Isn't that like what we are here on earth and we're not supposed to get too comfortable in the customs of the people of the earth because we're really not citizens of, heaven, of earth, we're citizens of heaven? Wow, so could you say that Elimelech was a type of latter-day Christian? Yes! Pictures abound. Continuing. Verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech. And his name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Mahalon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Let's run through this quickly. I don't want to stop at every place. I want the story to have some cohesiveness. Elimelech, the word Elimelech means God is king, or God is my king. It could mean both. Interesting, since it was the time of the judges, and there was no king in Israel. Remember? There's no king in Israel. But yet this man's name was God is my king, or God is king. His wife's name, Naomi, was translated pleasant. Quite coincidentally, not the name Israel, I mean, I'm sorry, the nation of Israel was also called in Bible scriptures, the pleasant land. So her name was translated pleasant. Israel was called the pleasant land. Now there was two sons, Mahalon, which, mean, which was Ruth's husband, which means unhealthy or sick. Weird name to name a kid. I'll never get that one. But it was fitting because we know what happens to him. And then there was Kilion, which means wasting or pining away. Wasting or pining away. Why you name your kids that, I don't know. However, verse 3, Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah. And the name of the other, Ruth. Now, just again, Orpa means fawn or gazelle. Ruth means friendship or desirable. Now, we know Israelites are not supposed to marry Moabite women. That's bad. Very, very bad. But, also, going back historically speaking, if you guys remember the book of Numbers, do you remember... The Moabite women are the ones that were used. You guys remember the story of the donkey? The talking donkey? You guys remember the prophet's name? Balaam. Remember Balaam's donkey? Balaam, when he couldn't curse the nation of Israel, he came up with the plan later to send Moabite women to infect the nation of Israel and to bring their morale down, and it certainly worked, as we know. Interesting little history there. However, Ruth's name means friendship or desirable. Wait a second. Now, so they were, they were what's called Moabites, otherwise known in the Hebrew as Gentiles. They were married to a Israelite, a forbidden love. Sound familiar? These ladies, Ruth is a picture of the church. Forbidden. Why would God, who called the Jews find himself in love with non-Jews accepting us in. You're going to watch this picture develop. It's the most beautiful picture in Scripture. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Mahlon and Kilion also died, so the women survived her two sons and her husband. Please, let's re review this without stopping every minute. So this man named Elimelech, his family is dying in his hometown. So he goes 75 miles away, takes his wife and his two sons. They get there, and at least they find some bread to eat. But for whatever it is, and they don't say what it was, Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi with two kids to raise. Well, they grow. They go possibly from 10 to 20 in that area. They, get, they marry. She's got her joy at least restored. Well, I don't have my husband, but I have my two sons and my daughter-in-laws. And then they both die. I mean, could you imagine for a second? This woman's got to be looking up at God and going, what did I ever do to you? Ah, that's such a sad line. So the woman survived her two sons 
and her husband. Verse 6, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Now, who is the bread that came from heaven? Who is the bread of life? She had heard she was going back to Bethlehem because she had heard that the bread was coming down from heaven. Come on. Coincidences? This is so beautiful. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law daughters Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of your husband. So she decides, I've had enough of this place. And besides, the house of bread is starting to have bread again. So she packs up, they get on the highway, they're on the off ramp or wherever it is they are and she finally says, you know what girls? You've been so good to me. You were great to my sons, you're great to me, but Go. Don't stay with me anymore. Go back to your houses. Find husbands. You're young enough. Go. Go live your life. Verse 9 at the end. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept, and they said to her, Surely we'll return with you to your people. No, we're staying with you. Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that, ready, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Give me your attention. They say, no, we're staying with you. She says, are you crazy? Listen, I respect your loyalty. I appreciate your loyalty, but God's hand's gone against me. I'm cursed. Go. If I had a husband, if I gave birth tonight, you're going to wait for them? You're going to restrain yourself? Go. you got your whole life before you. Homiletics. Application. Guys, your situation looks bleak. There's no logical way for things to work out. You've done the math. You make $2,500 a month and your bills are $5,500. It doesn't work out. That's it. It can't happen. Do you understand? Her logic is irrefutable. The one Orpa goes, you're right. Thank you for releasing me from my vow. Honorable as Orpa was, we say goodbye to the gazelle. She runs like a gazelle. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you glad the story doesn't end there for her or for us? Now look at this woman. No wonder. Look at this woman. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back. She says this to Ruth because Ruth clung to her. That word for, for clung there, it's the same word as clinging to your husband that's used earlier in Scripture. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave or cling. New King James says clung. Um, Old King James says cleave. It means like glue. Like as in, I ain't going nowhere. Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, you ready? Guys, stop, stop. Don't read, don't read. Come here, come here. <laughs> Ruth says seven things that somehow, some way, the Lord Jesus said seven I am's that confirm that he will never leave us. I don't remember all of them, but you can find them. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, I am, I am, I am. Seven times. Ruth here confirms in seven different ways. Here's what she looks. Now, I want you to picture the scene. 
I mean, I don't know if they're in a field. I don't know if they're in a tent. I don't know. But every once in a while, something happens in no place that God hears and goes, he stops all of creation and looks down at the heart. You know, the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord, they go to and fro across the whole earth, looking for a heart that's loyal to him, that he can show himself strong on behalf of. He's looking. And one person makes all the difference. Now, I also want you to know, if you're looking at um, a genealogy of the Lord, there's four women in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ruth is one of them. The others, <laughs> for you ladies who might have a, a past, let me tell you something. <laughs> One's a prostitute. The other one's an incestual woman. I mean, there is hope in Christ as much as any place ever. And of course, you guys know Mary's the other one. Here's what Ruth said. You ready? Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For where you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and my God, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts us. What a woman. What a woman. What man. Hearing a woman say that, whose heart wouldn't be stolen. There they are, in some backwoods. I mean, this is like saying they were in... Does anybody know where Venus, Florida is? It's like this little tiny town in the middle of nowhere. There they are in, in Moab. So, and she says, go, and one leaves. And she says, I'm not leaving. She says, go, live your life. No, where you go, I go. Where you die, I die. My people are your people. Your God is my God. May God kill me if anything but death parts us. And God's angels are looking and going, did you hear that? I am found loyalty. It reminds me of the time where the centurion God the centurion guard, sorry, says to the Lord Jesus, my, my servant is sick. Can you heal him? And the Lord Jesus said, absolutely, let's go. And he goes, no, 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 no. You don't got to come to my house. I'm not worthy. I'm a man under authority. I say to one, go, he comes. I say to another, come, he comes. You say the word and it will be done. And then the, the Bible says something it hardly ever says. It said that Jesus was amazed. He blew his mind. He said, I haven't found such faith in all of Israel. I imagine the Lord Jesus, still in his throne in heaven, looks down at this woman, Ruth, and goes, I can't find loyalty like that in all the nation of Israel. Look at this. Look at this. Talk about vows. Let's read it again. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. For the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. <gasps> Ladies, run a melt your man's heart. Say it. He'll melt his heart. He might not. He'll, be, he'll play all tough. Yeah, whatever, whatever. He'll go in the bathroom. <laughs> What's going on there? Bad food. I'm okay. <laughs> There's something interesting here that you'll miss unless you, unless you do your, ready? Exegetus. If you exegete the passage, you'll notice there she says, the Lord do so to me. The Lord. That word for Lord there. Elohim, Yahweh, Jehovah. Now, this woman is a Moabite. Moabite worshipped a god named Chemosh. 
If you guys remember studying Chemosh when we were going through the Judges, this was a God who required human sacrifice. Apparently, she wasn't kidding when she left her people. She left her God. Now, what's happening here is Naomi and Ruth are trading places, which is an amazing exchange to have. Naomi left her people to go dwell amongst the people of strange language. They have this thing, and you could Google it if you're into really, really, I'm talking about deep studies. There's something called the Moabite Stone, which tells all the stories of the wars that the Moabites had with Israel. Phenomenal how they completely screwed the stories up, though, how they won all the wars that the Bible says they lost. <laughs> kind of weird. Like, if you ever read a book, if you ever read any um, textbooks from, like, um, Vietnam, in the Vietnamese textbooks, they swear they won, uh, the Korean textbooks, they swear they won the war. Uh, German textbooks, they swear they won. It's amazing how the things, so the Moabite stone tells all these things. And it's a very strange language. It's just a little different than regular Hebrew, but it's different enough that the Hebrew would hear it. Now so, again, Naomi leaves her land she goes to this land where everything's different. Society is completely different. Now, how many of you all come from another country? Brazilian, Jamaica, right? Haiti, Haiti. Cyprus. Cyprus, Jamaica, England. Isn't it really tough to get used to? Man, people act differently here. <laughs> When I first started training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and it was trained by all Brazilians, let me tell you, it takes a little getting used to their ways. Why are these people so friendly? I come from New York, you know what I mean? It's like, we smile, it's fake. <laughs> hey, they're smiling and hugging and kissing. Now, we do that in Italian. I'm Italian-American. We hug and kiss, and that's what we do in our family. But outside the family, we keep our friends close and our enemies closer. We don't, uh, but here these people, and all of a sudden, after two or three years, you fall in love with their culture, and you start to, they're the nicest, oh my goodness, I love your culture, Brazilians. <laughs> you haven't been there yet. I don't want to go there, I heard all about the women there. I'm afraid. <laughs> so, now she goes, I didn't mean no disrespect when I said that, by the way. No, yeah, no, but I heard about the billboards and everything there. There's people always half naked there or something like that. <laughs> so now you trade Naomi, and now Ruth is now leaving hers and going to Bethlehem. And now, I mean, as sojourner as Naomi was, is now Ruth is you're not just talking about a woman with the right heart. Man, she's got the guts to back it up. I'm going. A Moabite? Going, listen to me. Moabites are shunned. They're hated. They remember. You guys remember, might remember there's a, a really crazy psalm written. When the nation of Israel was conquered, one of the psalm writers wrote this psalm that says, we sat down by the river. I'm trying to, I'll, I'll paraphrase it because I don't remember exactly. We sat down by the river and we wept. For there our captors requested a song. They wanted mirth. I'll sing them a song, basically, the psalm writer writes. Happy is the one who dashes your little ones against the rocks. Do you guys remember, anybody remember that psalm? It's the craziest psalm. And you're thinking, well, that's not very nice. That's how they felt about the Moabites. Oh yeah, come on Moabites, we'll kill you. And this was not, this is not our society. People got killed every day there. It was just part of it. You died. Like Chicago. <laughs> Finishing. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now that doesn't necessarily apply that she's like, okay, then I'm not going to talk to you anymore. They don't really know scholars. Are, but then she said, okay, I guess you're going with me. Now when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Verse 19, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem and it happened. 
when they came to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Give me your attention real quick. Let me give you a little background on what's happening here. They left because of the famine. Now, in a society that was based agricultural, every possession you had was wrapped up around what? The land that you possessed. Now, the Israelites were given a land, but in those days, if there was famine, you could sell your land to somebody else and they possessed it. What then, is, what then did Elimelech have when he left Israel? Squat. What is Naomi coming back to? Nothing. Zero. Now the town was a, a fairly large town for the time, but not giant. She comes back and the women remember that she's been gone, some say 10 to 12 years. Oh, Naomi's back. Naomi's back. What's she coming back to? She doesn't even know where she's going to stay. She doesn't have any land. She just heard there was bread there. Also telling testimony of how amazing Ruth is, probably knowing that as well. But, verse 20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. The word Mara means bitter. Bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Now, there's something interesting here. Often it's been asked, do the names mean what they mean because of what happened, or did the names mean it beforehand? Apparently, in this section of Scripture, they meant it beforehand. Because why would she say, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter, unless her name was given to her before it meant what she lived out. Does everybody understand what I just said there? So she wasn't, her mother saw her and she said, she's so beautiful, let's call her pleasant. Now why they named their kid sickly and pining away, I don't know. I named my son a king, you know what I mean? Verse 21, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty again. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. I'm sorry, guys. We can do this for hours. We have to stop here. But let me tell you, I encourage you to read the next three chapters. It is the most beautiful book you've ever seen. And the pictures and the types, and again, the pregnancies of what's going to happen. Now, so let me tell you, you can do a three-hour Bible study. Why does he say that they came back at the time of the barley harvest? That's one of those things. Remember we looked at that the root, that the, uh, I remember the word. The rabbis called a remez. It's a signpost. Dig deeper here. Now, we can go on again for hours and hours, and I can explain to you, but this time of the barley harvest also was significant of the Feast of Pentecost, which is the same time the Lord was crucified. Ah, so much, so much here. Can't do it all. I suggest you get a really good commentary if you want to dig deeper, because it's just so deep we can go. But let me tell you, the story of redemption here and what happens... God is so good. Read it. Apply it. And listen. Uh, the overriding theme of the book of Ruth, application-wise, is this. Don't look at your circumstances. For God is able to do anything to bless you. Beyond the natural to the supernatural. And you just might be that Ruth Moabitess cast out, have no business being a part of the body, and God says, are you kidding me? I know, not only do I know where you've been, I know it's in your heart, and you're exactly who I wanted. We have this idea that God is like, okay, let's see, I'll take you and you, well, you come with him, so I'll take you too, and I'll take you and you, and well, you come with him, so I'll take... God doesn't do that. The Bible says that you are the pearl of great price, that if you were the only one, he says, I'd die just for you. Just for you. So amazing. And the story of Ruth and Boaz, and where do you see when Boaz comes into the picture? It's, it's amazing. I can't wait for next week, guys. 
Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word that is so supernatural and amazing. Thank you, God, for the hope that is the book of Ruth after all those months of the judges, God. You brought right in the middle of it hope that does not disappoint. God, and I do pray for any person that's here that, that, that didn't need a, a Bible lesson, God. What they needed was an encouraging word. I pray that they would hold on to the heart of Ruth and see that their Redeemer is mighty and He lives and He's greater than, than bread and He's greater than finances and He's greater than death and He's greater than relationships and He's greater than, than flesh and blood. God, I pray for that one person here that just needed some hope, that today give them hope because this word is about hope. We love you and we thank you, God. And these things we do pray for your glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.